All right. Praise Jesus. So we're dealing with running your race, running your race, running your race. It's it's a topic I'm sure almost everybody's very familiar with, okay, uh, but running your race. So Hebrews chapter number 12, and then the first verse, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight which so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So I'm going to read the verse again. Wherefore, seeing we are also, and you notice it's not talking to just one person. This is, you know, a letter written to people, all right? I could say peoples, <laughs> okay? It says, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, Hebrews 12, comes right after Hebrews 11. In Hebrews 11, we have those we popularly refer to as the heroes of faith, okay? The hall of fame of faith, okay? In Hebrews, you know, the elders obtained a good report and we have a long list of the elders of the faith as it were. So Hebrews 12, I haven't talked about all of that in the 11th chapter. Hebrews 12 now says, we're surrounded with a great cloud of witnesses. So what are we to do, all right? So I want you to see the the writing, wherefore, seeing we also are surrounded with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us, all right, so seeing we are surrounded with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us, seeing we are surrounded, I want you to see it, with great cloud of witnesses, let us, so it means we saw them, they ran their races, all right, we saw that they did their stuff, they finished their own life, they, they're, they're done and gone. So wherefore, seeing that they now surround us, all right, we have the witnesses on the grandstand, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So throw away the weight, lay aside the sin, all right? Lay aside every weight and the sin that easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race set in front of us. Let's see the Amplified, please. Amplified for um, this particular verse. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Because I, I want us to see something, and that's the fact that running a race is not something for those, you know, we just leave out and say, well, they're in the five-fold ministry, all right? So I want you to see this. Amplified um, says, therefore then, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses who have borne testimony to the truth, let us strip off and throw aside every encumbrance that's unnecessary weight and that sin which so readily, deftly, and cleverly clings to and entangles us. And let us run with patience, endurance, and steady and active persistence the appointed course of the race that is set before us. Let us run with that patience, with that perseverance, with that endurance. So I want you to see something here. Is that very last line, well, second to the last line, last line here is before us, okay? That very second to the last and the penultimate line there, it says the appointed course of the race that is set before us. Because you need to ask yourself, okay, whose race am I running? Or maybe we start with the first question, am I even running? Am I, am I aware of any race? Am I aware of anything? Am I, am I aware? Okay, am I aware? So am I in a race? Is that something I'm supposed to be conscious of? Is that something I'm supposed to be mindful of? Am I in a race? And once again, I'm saying that this is not for who pay people. This is not for those who are aware there's a call of God on their lives. There is a general call of God upon the church of Jesus Christ. All right. The church is the ecclesia, the called out ones. That in itself is a calling. All right. Hebrews 12 also refers to us as a part of the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, you know? Let's just, you know, maybe switch to King James and then, yeah, just read from the 22nd verse, maybe New King James, and then read from the 22nd verse, you know, where we talk about, you know, the fact that we've come to Zion. So verse 22, and then we'll just read down. But this is, you know, just that awareness, all right? 
Is there a race? Is there something you're conscious of? Is there something you're running at? So Hebrews chapter 12 and then verse 22. We could just do New King James for it and then we thank you. He says, but you've come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. This is where we have come to, verse 28, please. I mean, did I say 20, 20, 23? Thank you. He says, we've come to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. So we've come to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn. We are the general assembly. We are the church of the firstborn. So if you don't know if there's any other calling outside of that, that in itself is a calling. You have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Hope you notice the word called. All right, that's our popular first Peter chapter two. And then the ninth verse, he called us out of darkness, all right, into his marvelous life. So you and I have to understand that there is a calling upon the church. And 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which we might get to today, but if we don't, while I'm at it, let me just mention the fact that the Bible lets us know, all right, that there are many members of the body of Christ, that, you know, <laughs> the body having many members is still one body. And, then, you know, it begins to give that, um, you know, revelation of understanding that each member has its role, has a part to play. So there's a call. There's a call. The obvious part of you, if you went out today, you obviously might have had to brush your teeth. I mean, you had to do something with your hair. You had to do something with your face. You have to put some clothes on. But then all of your body went out. Your liver, your kidney, your intestines, your left ventricle, right ventricle, your bronchi, every part of you stepped out of the house. Every part of you went out, all right? So it wasn't just a part we made up of clothes, you know, wore socks on or something. Every part of us stepped out. So there is a calling. And until the church of Jesus, maybe, um, but really, at the end of the day, Ephesians says, till we all come, all right? There's a fullness the Father would have the church come into. There is a fullness, and this is important so that you and I understand I have a place I have a role I've got something to do and when we get this it would reduce the self-esteem issue that we have in the body of Christ so um, I I'm not greater than you because I'm preaching or teaching all right I'm not above you so it these are funny things that need to be looked at all right um you know, so for instance, you know, um, if I say, you know, um, don't, don't call me um, Pastor Rex or some, just call me brother. You know, some of you feel, you know, wouldn't that be like disrespectful? But it's not. Don't even call me brother. Call me my first name. I, I can't dare do that. But then every day you say Jesus. You don't say brother Jesus or master Jesus. Or you just, you call his own first, you call him Jesus. And you didn't mean disrespect when you said so, all right? Now, someone says, oh, won't we be teaching dishonor? The issue is not the dishonor. The issue is the attachment to the nomenclature, the titles, the, all of that, okay? So I could say something with value, all right? But then I could say something because that's, that's just how we say it. But my point is this, how Jesus has elevated us. Okay, we preach it, we teach it, we're seated together with him. We're seated with him. But unconsciously, someone else is higher than me in the kingdom. All right, but Jesus is not. Jesus brought me to his own level. So that person higher than me is the person higher than Jesus. We need to think of all of this. Now, please, um, I, I, I know that the people I'm addressing understand the basic approach and the rightly division of the word. This is separate from you giving honor to whom it is due. This is separate, like Paul wrote to Timothy, that those who labor in the word should be counted worthy of double honor. So there is that honor you give to those who teach the word, those who teach you the word, those who brought you up in the things of the spirit or still bring you up in the things of spirit and things of faith. You honor them, Bible says, for their work's sake. So all of that is in place. But then there's the honor that belongs to the Lord that unconsciously we might not even give to him because somewhere in our mind, you know, um, Jesus is secondary, you know, but let me not jump too, you know, let me not jump too deep, you know, in, into that, you know, right now, let me not jump too deep into it. But what I need us to understand is that there is a race for us to run. Oh, there is a race for us 
to run. And that Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, seeing that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us, all right? And it's very important you see that. Thank you. Therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, put it aside. There are things that weigh you down. They are not sins, all right? But they could weigh you down. They could weigh me down, all right? Then he talks about the sin that so easily besets us. He says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The Living Bible, it's an, you know, older, you know, it's not usually in most of these apps. It added there, run with patience, the particular race that is set. So there's a particular race. I'm not running someone else's race. There's a general body of Christ race. Just told all of us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. But in as much as told all of us to preach the gospel in all of the world, in Acts chapter 16, we see that Paul attempted to go to two places to preach and the Holy Ghost didn't allow him. There's a Holy Ghost against what Jesus was saying, no, but there was a need for him to be in Macedonia at that time. So there's the general call and then the general race, but then there will be specifics. There will be specifics. That's why sometimes God might not mind where you live, where you reside, wherever you want to live, stay there. But there are times when it goes, this is how I want you to be. This is where, you know, what I want. This, 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 it's, there are certain times and seasons and sometimes almost for some people, most of their lives, very specific instructions about location, about relationships and association, different instructions, but there is a race. And that's one thing I need us to just embrace in, in this first part. There is a race to be run. There is a race to be run. Now we'll go to 1 Corinthians chapter number nine. We'll pick it from the 24th verse, 1 Corinthians chapter nine. Reading from 24 to 27, it's another, you know, very familiar place in the Bible, but I need you to please just see it. All right, thank you. It says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? So it says, run in a way that you may obtain. So everybody runs in a race, but only one person wins. Only one person gets first prize. So it says, run in a way that you get the prize. So there is a race, all right? But then we're not told there is a prize. Did you see it? There's a race. There's a prize. Only one person receives a prize. You run in such a way you want to get it. Let's see NLT for this verse. So I might just ask us to stay with NLT to 27. And if need be, we might just switch. So it says, um, remember that in a race, everybody runs. But only one person gets the prize. You also must run in such a way. Please see this. You also must run in such a way that you will win. So he's, he's, he's writing to the Corinthian church. So here again, like in Hebrews, he's writing to people, not to a person. So he's telling all of them, run. Now let's see the next verse. Really like interesting, you know, reading here. It says, all athletes practice strict self-control. They do it to win a prize that will fade away but we do it for an eternal prize. So I want you to ask yourself again, the first question, am I running? Am I even aware there's a race? Do I still think of it? Or have I forgotten about it in the midst of all the things I'm trying to sort and career I'm trying to build and all of that. And this, please understand quickly, is not in any way to knock anything anybody might have ventured into or you are doing, but this is to bring eternity into view. Please get this. This is to bring eternity into view. And Paul is saying here, the athletes, they run to win prizes that will fade away. But it's not just athletes that win things that will fade away, right? Everything on this earth will fade away. He says, but we do it for an eternal price. Question is, are we? Paul was speaking for himself, and of course, as a representation of the body of Christ, and the things we do for the kingdom is for something spiritual. Question, are we, are you mindful of a race? Are you mindful of something? Are you mindful of an assignment? Are you living in the, in the now of it as per consciousness? Please understand. So I read again. 
All athletes practice strict self-control. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So there is an eternal prize. So I'm laboring, I'm pushing. And let me quickly say, um, I could be in full-time ministry and not be giving my best into it. So don't be fooled, please, with the fact that, well, those in ministry always just have it all sorted out. It's we that, you know, trying to still do career with a mix of this. It's not always about that. It's run the race in front of you. Run the race set in front of you, not the race you chose for yourself, not the race you assumed by yourself. No, the one set in front of you. So I need you to see it. I need to understand it. I need to get this. All right, let's see next verse, verse 26. So Paul says, I run straight to the goal with purpose in every step. This is powerful. I run straight to the goal with purpose in every step. I am not like a boxer who misses his punches. Verse 27 now. I discipline my body like an athlete training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I feel that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. So disqualification here, we've come to understand by looking at other scriptures like 1 Corinthians chapter 3, all right, where Paul said, you know, let's just go there just for somebody's sake. 1 Corinthians 3, we could pick it from the 10th verse, okay? Let's see, 1 Corinthians 3 from verse 10. And then just read so that there's that um, context there. Great. So, yeah, I think we'll still stay with this one. Um, I mean, NLT, I think we'll stay with it. Because of God's special favor to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now, others are building on it, but whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. So let's go on. 11. But no one can lay any other foundation than the one we've already, we already have, and that's Jesus Christ, the K-12. Okay, yeah. Now, anyone who builds on that foundation, watch this, may use gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, straw, okay? But watch this now. But there is going to come a time, all right, of testing at the judgment day to see what kind of work each builder has done. Everyone's work will be put through the fire to see whether or not it keeps its value. Now see the next one. If the work survives the fire, the builder will be rewarded. Next one now. But if the work is burnt up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builders themselves will be saved, but like someone escaping through a wall of flames. And this is like super graphic. The picture here, is like, you know, someone who just woke up and the entire house was not only filled with fumes, but engulfed in fire. That person will not remember to pick any other thing, if you understand that picture. The person runs out of the house with nothing. So that's the picture. The person will be saved, but like someone, or let's see the amplifier. So that, that because when you don't get the picture, I think, because Paul said, oh, disqualify, what then would be the disqualification? Would it be, is the fact that everybody's work will be tested. And that day will come. Everybody's work will be tested. You and I must understand that this day is going to come. I could act like I'm doing what I was called to do. I could do the one I was even called to. I could do the one that someone else was called to do just so that I'm not idle. I could do what, but the day will come, the work will be tested, all right? The day will come, the work will be tested. Please let's see the amplified of this and see how he helps us put it. But I need to have that picture in mind, all right? The person will be saved, but like someone escaping through a wall of fame. So amplified, please. Are, are we liking this? It's, it's a really good topic, all right? shouldn't get you scared, shouldn't make you feel horrible. It's just, this is what we need to see. Nah. But if anyone, you know, person, if any person's work is burnt under the test, all right, he will suffer the loss of it all, losing his word, though he himself be saved, 
but as one who has passed through fire. No, not what I'm looking for. Try TBT. One of them has it. All right. I'm not sure if we don't see TPT or it in TPT, we could do MSG. But that that's the oh simple. Great. It, it's it's TPT. If anyone's work is consumed by the fire, he will suffer great loss. Yet he himself will barely escape destruction, like one being rescued out of a burning house. So that's if you read the King James and then you meditate on the King James. This is what you arrive at, all right? And I think I've shared that thing before that sometimes it's the King James, maybe you spend time meditating on, by the time you see some of these other, you know, translations, like, oh, this, this was almost like, you know, similar to the light I saw, all right? Because obviously it was the Holy Spirit enlightening you in that. So anyone, everybody's work will be, will be tested. That day will come. It's, it's so amusing and amazing that we could be too carried away with life, carried away with human definitions of success, carried away with every single thing, and then forget that one day. And please, I repeat, this has nothing to do with, oh, he's in, you know, he's a preacher, so that, you know, he's not talking to himself. No, I'm talking to all of us. Ken Hagen had, you know, told this, you know, I've heard it in more than one message. And I remember the very first time, you know, that when you hear something and it sends chills down your spine, like they say, all right, boy, it kind of like just, you know, brings that awe or purpose on you. Okay, Hagen had pastored for about 12 years and he did evangelistic work. Then the Lord was talking to him about ministry, okay? And, and this, this is the interesting thing now. So the Lord said to him that I never called you to pastor to begin with. So he was being now told, hey, I've called you to teach. This is your assignment. And then Jesus said to him, you are just entering into the first phase of your ministry. And then Jesus said, many ministers live and die without entering the first phase of your ministry. Did you hear that? Many ministers live and die without entering the first phase of their ministry. So you're like, oh my goodness. And so that's all I'm trying to point out. You could be a minister, you could be in ministry, but are you doing the one you were sent to do? I think it was 1983 or so, you know, Kenneth Copeland got to a point in his life where it was like, you know, Lord, I'm done. Let me just die. I mean, could you think of 83? This is... Yeah. 2023, like how many years ago, right? That's was 40. So there about, you know, 83, a couple of like, I'm done, let me just die. This, you know, whole work is heavy on me. I'm just, and Jesus said to him, it's not the one I gave you that is wearing you out. It's the one you added to it. I could, I mean, as I'm saying Copeland's story right now, I remember Jerry Savelle's story where the Lord told him, trim down. You are doing many things I did not call you to do in ministry. So these are seasoned ministers, guys. All right, I just gave you three big names, as it were. And Lord said to Jezebel, trim down, which affected certain people they had on staff. Now, some of these departments, I never asked you to do those assignments. So the departments were never ever to exist in your ministry. So I needed to get this whole idea, you know, so that you don't think, well, he's in ministry you know, so it's just, you know, talking to we who are not food. That, that's not it. Because someone in full time could be in fool's time. All right? And then someone active and busy in ministry could be busy just running a competitive race. Trying not to be left behind, you know, by what it seems like, you know, contemporaries are busy doing. You know, just, I mean, if, if you know, excuse me, if they're doing, you know, prayer, I, I need to do prayer. If they are doing outreach, I need to do outreach. If they're having, you know, Zoom meetings, I gotta have my, if they're doing worship night, I must do what, you know, just people are just, some people are running competitive races. Some are on the other extreme of, I don't have to do anything, I don't have to do all that, but I do, and they end up doing nothing. And some of us have also just gotten ourselves into some rot or the other, we're just stuck. And we won't get to heaven and say, well, Lord, it was a job I got. It was the kids you gave me. It was all the, well, the, the kids we had, right? Gave, 
in that context could be, you know, anyway, it could be debatable. <laughs> All right, maybe I should just quickly explain that. So, you know, listen, I mean, you know how babies come, right? It's egg meets with something and then voila. Then, so I'm, I'm saying as often as you allow the eggs to keep meeting, you know, with stuff. So you can say, well, God give us another one. <laughs> so if you have nine or 15, you can't keep saying God. So that I'm just trying to explain. So I'm sure you got that. But the point is, are we going to stand in front of him and say, because every man's work will be tempted. Now, First Corinthians 3 also seemed like Paul was addressing ministers, all right, talking about their work, I've laid foundation, you now build on that foundation and everything. I agree, but we still know we would all stand. All right, Second Corinthians chapter number five. And then the 10th verse, Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 10. Let's see what the Bible tells us there, all right? It's for every one of us. It says, for we must all, so just in case someone says first Corinthians three is just for ministers. Here it says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This is for the believers, all right? That everyone may receive the good done in his body according to the thing he had done, be it, you know, you know, good or bad. You're gonna receive, you know, of the things you've you've done in your body. So what we're gonna be rewarded, and what do you think primarily God is gonna reward? just good deeds. No, it will be purpose. It will be assignment. There is a race set before you. Ephesians chapter two and then the 10th verse, Ephesians chapter two, 10. So what we're seeing these things and we need to embrace it. There is a race to be run. There is a race to be run. Ephesians two ten says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Because first Corinthians, I mean, second Corinthians 5, 14, 10 rather, just told us now, we're going to give account of the things we've done, good or evil. So when it comes to good, many just think, be nice to your neighbor, give food to the people on the streets and everything, good stuff. But here, what is good works? Well, we are his workmanship, created in Christ, just two good works, which he had before ordained. So in your path of purpose, being in it, functioning in it, th that's what your good works basically are. Amplify it, please. There is a race. There is a path, all right? We are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned ahead. We see that. Planned ahead or planned beforehand or for us. Watch this now. Taking parts which he prepared ahead of time. So God has a path prepared ahead of time for you, for me, taking parts which he prepared ahead of time that we should walk in them. See this, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. So there's a path. We cannot overstress this. There is a path. So my job, your job is to find the path, stay in the path. Find the path, stay in the path. Find the path, stay in the path. This is God's will for us. So are you aware there's a path? Are you aware there's a race? Once again, this is not about pulpit. This is, this is not about pulpit. This is just understanding what your assignment is and endeavoring to fulfill it. Understand what the assignment is, endeavor to fulfill it. Your assignment might be the Lord telling you, your kids are your ministry. And then you have this fire burning in you. And, and I mean, I learned that from Hagen. I learned that from Bishopo many years ago. Passion doesn't justify ministry. Thank God for passion. All right? But you must understand the assignment. If, if I could do a one-on-one -on -one with Ken Hagen's wife, you know, it would be easy to just ask her to say again, just share all of again, how was there any pressure? All right? Seeing you know, younger women, you know, have meetings and have big platforms. And because she'd been asked a number of times, what's your ministry? And she would just point to Ken Hagen, that's my ministry over there. Mm -hmm, I'm okay. Don't forget, many ministers, Jesus said to Hagen, live and die without entering the first phase of their ministry. 
he said ministers, meaning they were actively doing ministry. How many times have we just pushed pastor's wives? Oh, because her husband is a pastor, she should handle women's ministry, she should handle, uh, just we'll make a list of all those things that it's, it's for the, it's the pastor's wife's job, you know? But who said? I mean, Hagen went to a particular church and in the church, their tradition was a pastor who handled the men's Sunday school and the pastor's wife, one of the women says, he said, no, my wife's not going to do that. She's not preaching. She doesn't pray. Preach. Put the two groups together. And they had to. But the truth is, it's, it's just Sunday school. Any believer can stand up to do that. But he must have, well, they must have had what they understood the Lord saying to them. She said, no, you know. It's, it's just, I mean, every believer should be able to teach the word. And I knew, I know, I mean, she, she, I, the woman had the healing anointing. And she, if you watch some of the meetings, you find that she's rolling with her husband to lay hands on people. Sometimes she's laying hands on people herself. You know, she had the operations of spirit in her life. Okay, she's done tongues and interpretation. You won't see it in the fore, in the obvious, because she's not coming out of the microphone to do these things. But I still remember very, 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 very clearly. Hagen was preaching in a meeting and suddenly he just, you know, was struggling to stay you know, speaking in English, though it, it just switched. The thing had been happening, if I remember the first time I heard it, I felt, why is he stammering? What was going on with him here right now? And he was preaching, you know? And then, you know, he had to later explain that he's, he's struggling to stay out of, of that realm that is like being pulled into it. It got the teaching to a point and just said, now, Lord, and he just switched. You know, like Jesus was basically physically there on the stage, but people like couldn't see that kind of thing. And he just kept on talking to the Lord, you know. And Orita, his wife was there, and she was also talking tongues. They're like, yeah, yeah. You know, so it became like a conversation between them and the Lord. It, it was amazing. But that person didn't grab the mic. And then they were instrumental in the ministry of Kenneth and Gloria Copeland. And then Gloria Copeland, is that, you know, became that big preacher all over the world. And I thought you have that. No, what about me, God? Am I not fulfilling? So that's why I'm saying this conversation today is not about pulpit. Please understand this. It's not about pulpit. It's just you being where he will have you be and doing what he will have you do. It's not pulpit. It's not pulpit. So that there's that satisfaction. And again, I remember also him saying that one of the most anointed Bible teachers he ever met was a Sunday school teacher. He said, I mean, and if again says one of the most anointed I've ever met, you know, he said one of the most anointed Bible teachers I've ever met was a Sunday school teacher. He said people would tell the person, come on, go and start something, go do something. He says, no, this is where the Lord put me. I was into Rick Renner. All right, some, was it last year, two years ago? And he talked about a particular woman that was in the children's ministry. I mean, this man is how old today? <laughs> and he said, that woman raised a whole lot of us. That woman raised a whole lot of us. Did you see that? You know, children's ministry, she stayed there. That was her ministry. That was her calling. That was her place. And people like Rick Renner came out of, you know, her molding, as it were. Some of you might have heard of Jimmy Swaggart before, very popular evangelist in the US. You know, there were other names, you know, but how was Jimmy Swaggart saved? Lester Summers' mom and his sister or sisters now, either sister, mom and sister, went to a particular place, saw kids playing around and, you know, just thought of how to reach out to those kids. So what did they do? They found a man that had a keyboard, asked him to borrow them that keyboard. Eventually they got the keyboard from him. And then they gathered these kids together to just teach them songs. That was it. But it had a very strong evangelical tilt in it. But it was also the parents of the kids where, oh, someone wants to teach our kids music. So it was, it was like music class. They taught those kids gospel songs, taught them the word, got a number of them saved. So an evangelist, I mean, more, about three, 
popular U.S. evangelist came out of that group. But one of the most popular that many people will know, you know, you know, was Jimmy Swaggart. But came out from where? Kids being taught, you know, um, church music. So once again, it's not pulpit. It's not who is in the fall. It's not, all right? There are people who work in organizations and they've saved, gotten, you know, through them, God has saved a lot of people. People have been born again through them. And they're just a regular person, maybe the janitor. Some do their everyday jobs and then they have strong prayer ministries. In his book, Art of Prayer, Ken Hagen talked about a woman that was given to prayer. And she would pray in a, you know, they used to refer to them as full gospel, all right? Just pray in a full gospel church into the city. And then pick another city, pray in full gospel church into the city. You know, Hagen said many of those pastors will get to heaven and they'll be surprised when Jesus calls up that woman to receive a reward because she prayed them in. She prayed the assignments in. I pastored in Jeopardy for a number of years and I've had to say this on the book that I am convinced that a major issue when I'm here is an answer to people's prayers. And I remember after I said so, there was a person who showed up who had this group and he said they used to, you know, pray around the city, training, training laborers and all that. Years that I met someone else again who was part of that same group who told me, do you know we used to do this before you came? That when we met you, we just were convinced that, I said, man, I cannot get out with anybody. I believe that, you know, God pulled me here as an answer to people's prayers. I believe that. Now, does that mean it wasn't in the plan of God? Some of those things get clear when we see Jesus himself, okay? But it could also be that it was in his plan. But yet again, like we know from scripture, God needs men on the earth to agree with him for that agenda to come to pass. For that agenda to come to pass. I'm aware that the grounds of Rema Bible Training Center in Tulsa, Oklahoma, used to be where someone went to pray like decades before Ken Hagen bought that property, Ken Hagen's ministry. It was a property where someone used to pray. It was just like woods anyway, you know, person would go in there and pray. And then those stories had lingered. Somehow they had bought the thing before they ever heard. So it wasn't that they heard the story and they went to buy it. I'm only saying, all right, many assignments, many, many more assignments are not in the forefront. There are few people in the, he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Of course, it's not limited to those by the time we get to 1 Corinthians 12, all right, we see, and then you go to Romans chapter, you know, 12 again, you, by the time you put whatever all those ministries are together, exhortation, because you find exhortation, all right, in Romans 12, you know, which is similar to the teaching of his, but still not saying. You find leadership, you see giving in Romans 12. Put all of those together. It still doesn't cover, you know, thank you. All right. Thanks, about Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. So he's saying gifts, all right. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, you know, or ministry, let us wait on our ministry or teaching, all right? He that teaches on teaching, verse eight, he that exhorts, so it's separate from the teacher. On exhortation, he that gives, let him, you know, do it with simplicity, he that grooves or leads with diligence, he that shows mercy. I've heard, you know, you know, I've heard a preacher say, you know, when can he can taught the gifts of the spirit in first and answer, if he didn't finish teaching it, he forgot the one in Romans 12. Romans 12 is not gifts of the spirit, all right? These are not gifts of the spirit, in that sense, they're ministry operations, like in the latter part of First Corinthians 12. But if it's First Corinthians 12 from verse 7 to 11, or what about tongues and interpretation, what and what that's that's that. But then the latter part from 28 was ministry. That's what he's addressing here. Ministry also. He can talk that. So, and this person is world renowned too. And like if, and he'll be doing, you know, name calling, you know, then Egan got it wrong. They got it wrong. I'm like, sir, you didn't get what Egan was teaching. And first Corinthians 12 is not about gifts of the spirit is 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 not like you know tongues and interpretation and all that's addressing ministry more like anyway not necessary what i need us to understand is is this what i need us to see is 
there is a race to run. And the judge of the race is the one that calls us to the race. Colossians chapter 4 and then the 17th verse. You know, Colossians 4, 17. We, we must just put all these things together and see them. There is a race to run. You and I must wake up and say, I got to run the race. It says, and say to Archippus, see that you discharge carefully the duties of the ministry and fulfill the stewardship which you have received in the Lord. All right? Discharge carefully the duties of the ministry and fulfill the stewardship that you have received. So please be sure that the race you're endeavoring to run, you received it. You didn't conceive it. Hope you get the difference in the way I'm using it now. You didn't conceive. I don't mean conception like the Holy Ghost put in you and then you can No, you didn't come up with it. It wasn't just a good idea to you. Now, if that is what is permissible for you to do in this season, please, by all means, whatever your hand finds to do, like the Bible said, do. But have in mind that openness that you must maintain in fellowship with the Lord, such that when he refers to you or mentions to you to move to something else, you are not hugging too much what you feel you've received. But I must say again, please, there is a race to run. There is a race to run. There is, for every one of us, Philippians chapter 3, please, and then you know, we could just pick it from 12 into 14. Philippians 3, 12 to 14. We looked at it last week, but I mean last month. But it's important we just go over this again. Not that I have now attained this ideal or I've already been made perfect, but I press on to lay hold of, that is to grasp and make my own. That for which Christ Jesus the Messiah has laid hold on me and made you know, me, his own. Verse 13, please. I don't consider, brethren, that I have. I do not consider, brethren, that I have captured and made it my own yet. I've not owned it like I should, all right? But this one thing I do, all right? It is my one aspiration. That is forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Quickly, let's say, what lies behind? It could be failures. It could be success. Whatever it is stretch forward i beg you go on i beg you maybe it's so much failure that is behind you don't let it hold you back and 14 says i press on this is where the race is don't let what holds you back be oh i've achieved i've accomplished i've arrived all right i press on toward the goal to win the supreme and heavenly prize to which god in christ jesus is calling us upward I press on toward the goal. I press on toward the goal. Please see this. To win the supreme and heavenly prize, which God in Christ Jesus is calling us upward. So eventually, when we see the master face to face, there is a prize. There's something he will give us. So you have to run. You, you have to run with that mindset. I'm going to get something. I'm going to receive a prize. I'm going to receive of the Lord. Are, are we getting this, please? Super important. Did you get that? Super important. Each person has a race. There's an individual race. And, you know, in, in building the notes on self-sabotaging thoughts, there was, you know, something I... You know, like, oh, you didn't add that. And like I said to, you know, earlier when we began, you know, most of us were in here. Yeah. You know, my intention was to continue, you know, self-sabotaging talk like part two. But then this came stronger, just kept on getting stronger. I felt all right, well, you know, if, if this is that we'll do it. But this other part still fits. If I fit perfectly here, it is a self-sabotaging thought too. And that's this feeling of just being a supervisor in the body of Christ. All right a commentator and i've seen that i've addressed it with a few people thought about it you know maybe workers and leaders meetings you know some of those kinds of stuff you know because just realize that it's easy to analyze someone else's race someone else's assignment and not be mindful of your own you 
You don't even, you can't see your report card. You can't see your score sheet. You only do what you think you're doing, but then you feel you're in a good position. Some people make it worse. They believe God has called them, all right, to scrutinize and to analyze someone else's calling. I, I mean, there was a renowned preacher, you know, I just came across, you know, something was sharing. And then he picked someone's book and dissected it. Mentioned title of the book. I mean, an American preacher. Mentioned title of, so it wasn't just say something and, the, you know, those who know, know those who don't. Mm, he, he mentioned the title of the book. So, and it was, it was a New York bestseller type book. So I knew what he was saying. I knew who he was referring to. And he just finished it right there. And I'm like, oh, come on. Come on, sir. Even context shows that that was not what the person was referring to. You just picked the title and went off. But what was he addressing? Do you think you're playing fair? You know, and many people are, are not playing fair that way. They're just police. And let's even leave those who do it, you know, out there, you know, like on YouTube and everywhere within the local assembly. All right. Some might not be doing well in their own department or unit. Still a whole lot of things to work on. But the person just automatically just feels that I have something to say. That other department, in fact, the person who was backing up and then the person who was standing as usher. And then, and then you're like, the job you have still has a lot of things missing in it. Who, you know, like Andrew McGantz on, you know, when the person said something to him, you know, about his ministry. <laughs> I, I mean, when I heard that response, first time I heard it, I felt, ooh, this is... You know, Andrew told the person, who died and made you God? <laughs> like, who died and appointed you as God? Who, who put you there? But unconsciously, that's what we've become. That's what we've become. We need to understand. Say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry that you have received of the Lord. Ensure you fulfill it. Face your ministry. Take heed to your assignment. I mean, that clearly reminds me of something that Jesus said to Peter, you know, in, in John 21. And it's, it's so interesting, you know, how Jesus called Peter's attention, you know, after Jesus had told Peter, you know, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And then just started telling Peter, when you were young, you went wherever you were going to go. And then when you become old, someone is going to take your hand and lead you even to where you don't want to go. And I've said, Jesus said this to signify the type of death that Peter will die. So, okay, Jesus just finished telling Peter how he's going to die. All right? Thank you, Gabriel. Very, very, I say to you, when you were young, you girded yourself, walked wherever you would, and then when you're old, you will stretch forth your hand, and another will gird you and carry you where you don't want to. Verse 19 now. Thank you. This spake he, signifying by what death he will glorify God. And when he had spoken to him, what he'd see, and guys, I want you to see this. When I finished telling him, after he told him, you know, do you love me? Do you love me? Feed my sheep, feed my lamb, feed my sheep. Then now tells him how he's going to die. And then the Bible said that when he had spoken this unto him, he said to him, follow me. All right? Now, I just told you your assignment, feed my sheep. I told you how you're going to end up. Follow me. Next verse now. It's verse 20. Then Peter, watch this. Turning about, seeing the disciple whom Jesus loved following, that's John, right? Which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, who is it that betrays you? If you remember, it was John that leaned or um, asked the question. Peter, seeing John, said to Jesus, Lord, what, you know, what about this guy? All right, what, what shall this man do? You just told me about my life. What about him? Then Jesus answered and said to him, if I will, if I will, that he tarries till I come. What is that to you? You follow me. Oh, come on. Let's see TPT on this one. <laughs> on this, just this verse 22. It, it's interesting that Jesus had to tell Peter, face your own. All right? Face your own. Jesus replied, if I decide to let him live until I return, what concern is that of yours? You must keep on following me. 
at the end of the day, listen, we're not going to be rewarded for what someone else did or did not do. I, I think this is super clear. We will not be rewarded for what someone did or what the person did not do. You're going to be rewarded based on what you did. All right, and once again, this is for no reason to create condemnation. All right, if it hits at you, maybe because you're in a state where, you know, you need to wake up to what am I doing in my life? All right, but it shouldn't, um, let me quickly say this. Listen, first and foremost, Romans eleven twenty nine 29 makes it clear that the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. I say again, the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. Now, it doesn't say anything about assignments not being without repentance, okay? Uh, and what I mean by that is if God called you to Somalia in 19, um, in 2003, and then you don't go uh, in 2000, you now want to go in 2033, God might not say it's still Somalia, but then there's a call on your life, all right? So for the gifts and calling of God, out that repent and say, but calling, my calling is to go to Somalia. No, that's not the calling. That's the assignment. Who, who got that there? All right, that's not the calling. It's an assignment. I was assigned. I've been assigned to places. Now I'm assigned here in Canada. I was assigned somewhere in Djibouti, in Nigeria. I, I've, I've had assignments. Those are assignments. But as a call of God on my life, all right? You could call it, you know, the call to teach his word, but then it's many times sometimes not just that alone but there's a calling because teaching could be the office because you no know, it is an office right according to Ephesians 4 an office through which I can carry out the calling are you seeing this now so I'm called to do something Let, let's just say I'm called to communicate the word of life or I'm called to you know that how am I going to do that I need the office of the teacher to get it done I need the office of the apostle to get you understand so there is a calling there's a calling and then there are offices and then there are assignments. And so, but don't get lost or that most important thing is understand that you please, and I'm saying this in case you feel time has gone, people have passed me by, see where I am. I'm not where I'm supposed to be. The gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. Secondly, please, secondly, once you're ready and I'm assuming you are, all right? Or whenever you think you are and don't make it wait forever. Because you're going to get in front of him and, and say, um, you have, don't you want to just see him and get rewarded for something you did? We're not doing this thing for the reward, but the Lord will reward. All right. He will commit more things into our hands. He would give, he would, he would, hand, we're going to be able to handle more stuff for him. So the things that keep taking us away from yielding, responding, those are the things we need to fight. Those are the things we need to deal with. There are many people with many books, many prophecies, many visions, many, all right, but I'll, let me just, you know, I'll, I'll get there in a bit. We've got to understand, all right, let's, let's see James chapter number one and then the fifth verse. It's, it's, Ask, talking about wisdom and prayer, prayer for wisdom or the desire, the requirement. The, anyway, see it yourself. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives all men liberally and without upbraiding, and then it will be given. This is it. But I'm going to bring something out from this using the TPT very soon. But watch this. If any of you lack wisdom, and I'm applying this now to do you feel stuck? Do you feel like life has passed me by, people have passed me by? I've missed many supernatural opportunities or divine opportunities got put across my path. I've missed, I, I was supposed to be here by now. I should have, but listen, if, if that's you right now, the one who's your father always knows how to reroute to a point of, even someone who is 80 years old, if all the person has left is to live till 82, there's what God could show the person to do. And then the person will finish with those remaining two years with peace and joy. And nobody is 80, about to die at 82. You still have like 40, 50, maybe 60 years in front of you. 
Why then would you allow a self-sabotaging thought of it's over for you? Nothing good can come out of you anymore. Why allow that? If you feel stuck, your father knows how to move you into, okay, do this, do that, be here, be there. And you flourish in his will all over again. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Watch this. He says, God gives to all men liberally. This is the character of God. And he will not upbraid and it will be given to him. Let's see the TPT. I love how it puts it there. All right. And if you're going to love it. If any of you longs to be wise, ask God for wisdom. Watch this. This I'm, I'm, I'm not teaching on the wisdom prayer for wisdom part. I'm teaching on the character of God and the generosity of God. That's what I'm pointing out from this verse. If any of you longs to be wise, ask God for wisdom and it will, it will give it. Ask, it will give it. So it shows that God is a giver. All right, he says he won't see this now. He won't see your lack of wisdom as an opportunity to scold you over your failures. Oh, so beautiful. He will not see your lack of wisdom as an opportunity to scold you over your failures, but he will overwhelm your failures with his generous grace. He will overwhelm your failures with his generous grace. Is this helpful to somebody? Use this to knock off the lies of the enemy. Oh, you failed too much. God will not use you. Oh, you've messed up. God is not interested in you anymore. He's brought too many opportunities your way and you didn't maximize them. That's the end for you. Listen, God can pick you from all those failures and overwhelm you with his generous grace and reroute you. There's this mini book by Kenny again, The Gifts and Colors. And if you could find it, or maybe the audio or something, I talked about a preacher who left ministry in Vienna for 20 years. And like the guy came back, you know, after 20 years of just living, <laughs> in, in, you know, just living whatever, you know, lifestyle, 20 years. Hagen said there was an anointing on this man. All right? The guy came back into ministry. Now, of course, would ministry be like it was? I, I don't know the man's I can analyze. Some usually not. Some better. Sometimes just because of the mind, like, like you know, I think it was T.D. Jakes that said it. So a preacher did something. I won't need to, some of you might not story, but I won't need to mention names as well. All right? So a preacher in America did something. And then seven years later, it came, you know, in, you know, into public space, like newspaper and all of that. Seven, don't forget, seven years later. As of the time it came into public space, the man was, you know, having like 35,000 people in the stadium, like packing out crowds, was an evangelist, or is an evangelist, still like, right? Packing out crowds, 35,000 people. Then this information came out of all oh, this happened 30, I mean, seven years ago. And the crowd disappeared. <laughs> you know, I, I just loved the analysis. Trishek said, you know, no, it's just, um, you know, that human that he said, because for the last seven years, the crowd kept on growing. And there was no, I mean, it was just that one event. And, you know, the man had repented of it, really, and all of that. But the thing came up seven years later. So all that happened to all of you was you reacted on something that is past. But this man just blessed you last month. You were in his crusade. You partnered his ministry. It, it's just, you know, human reaction. It's just, and, and that's what it is. But this is it. People can have that towards you. It will be self-sabotaging to have that towards yourself. That's where I'm getting with this. Oh, is she not the one that did this? Oh, is she not the one that did that? If you remember when Jesus was in the house of Simon, all right, and then Mary came in with the alabaster box and all, and she was doing, and they said, oh, if he was really a prophet of God, he would have known the kind of person touching him. That woman ended up becoming a key disciple. I'm sure when some of them saw how rolling with Jesus, they could have felt, seriously, who that, hanging out, you know? We, so people might do that to you. Don't do that to yourself. That's when I'm going all of this. We might not be getting to people's minds to stop how they want to see us. We might not be getting to people's minds to stop how they want to interpret stuff. You might not be able to get into all of that, but you should not allow it to be a self 
sabotaging thoughts. Don't let the devil just implant that, you know, just boom. You just, you just keep having that, I'm, I'm not usable, I'm not useful, you know, and it's all because you allow the wrong impression of how God wants you to see yourself to be planted into you. So don't get into the supervisory stuff. Don't start poking your eye, all right? Jesus said, many of us forget that, you know, well, they didn't even say forget. Many do not take care of the log in their own eye, but they are busy, all right, talking about the speck in someone else's eye. And now it's easy. Oh, see him. Oh, see him. Oh, Romans 14, what verse is that? Is it four? Romans 14, let's just speak it from the first verse, please. Romans chapter 14. Don't turn yourself to a supervisor. Where there's no responsibility, all right? <laughs> Thank you. There, there's, no, there's no accountability, all right? Where there's no responsibility, there's no accountability. Okay, it's verse four. It says, who are you to judge another man's servant? To his own master, he stands or falls. Yay. And, you know, he shall be holding up because God is able to make him stand. Now, if you have authority or responsibility over people, that's different. Okay. You have, a, you have a, where, where there's no responsibility, there's no authority. But if you have responsibility, it's like your kids and your own home. You have responsibility, you have authority. But you can't hear you or see someone else's kid in a park or in their house or and then you want to go and scold or spank someone else's kid when the parents were there and they didn't hand the kid over to you and say take care of my kid watch my kid for 30 minutes will be gone all right there's no responsibility then there's no authority but where there's responsibility then you could come and say hey it shouldn't be this way shouldn't be that way so we do that with people but god did not appoint you as a supervisor in the body or in your local assembly amongst your friends he's not i repeat what i said earlier god will not judge you for what someone else did or did not do god will judge you for what you did or did not do face your own i mean many of us have read ghost now so i could you know give that easy story about william braham and you know how that it was reported there that you know he left his assignment as being a prophet, stepped into the teaching ministry, began to teach certain things considered as heresies in the body of Christ and all of that. Kenny Hagen was with a group of people. He sensed that urge to pray. Now, this is not in God's realms. And then just, I need to pray, I need to pray now, went someplace and, you know, the folks went with him, you know, to, and, and he prayed out and while praying, began to prophesy. And part of it was the fact that, you know, Brian will be out, you know, Prophecy that at the end of, I think by the end of the following year, you know, the person who right now seems to be in the forefront of the healing move will be out. Because of the errors and all. Now, there was Ken Hagen, then there was Gordon Lindsay. Some of you might have heard that name before. Gordon Lindsay, Christ for the Nations. Uh, I think, yeah, Christ, C-F-A-N. Christ for all nations is um, Reinhard Bonke. So Christ for the Nations, Gordon Lindsay. Um, that was where, you know, um, Archbishop Benson, the Hosa went for his, you know, for, for Bible school, all right, where while he was there, he sensed he wasn't supposed to finish and then, you know, had to go back. But that, that was, you know, go under God and Lindsay. Now, God and Lindsay was told by the Lord to go talk to Branham. I mean, they had, and Branham said a few things, no, no, no. But then the Lord, you know, Put that urgency in him so he would try and catch him in this meeting they say he just went there he would fly to the other place just you know all those kind of things and then again said those same things they said to him why, why don't you try and talk to him and then he said well the lord told me what will happen but the lord did not tell me to go tell him that all right I, are you getting this the lord revealed to me what will happen yeah this will happen but i wasn't sent I'm, I'm, I wasn't sent as police. I wasn't sent, hey, go and stop him. Go and make sure it doesn't happen. The Lord didn't tell me that part. And we need to get this. What really is your assignment? All right. And the biggest favor, if I could call it favor, we could do for our lives and our destinies is intimacy with the Lord. Don't forget what Jesus said to Peter. 
if I want this person to stay till I return, how is that a concern to you? Yours is to follow me. Thank you. If I decide to let him live until I return, what concern is that of yours? You must keep you. Keep on following me. Keep on following me. And, and this is going to help us. The biggest favor you could do, your own intimacy with the Lord, not activities first, your own intimacy with the Lord, you following him, you following him, your intimacy. Are we, are we getting this thing, please? It's, it's really important. Because when someone becomes financially comfortable, we have this belief somewhere, oh, the person is fine. The person is all right. The person is in purpose. Many people are lost. Some got lost the moment they entered a particular relationship because that relationship took them off God's plans for their lives. Some, you know, you know, of course, relationship leading to marriage. Some was a job. Some was a group of friends. Some, it, it was just whatever it is. Just to, but my point again is wherever that person is at now, there is always a rerouting. There's always, but some are just so, and that's why the Bible talks about the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. You could be so comfortable, you can be maligning and disregarding people who don't have your, you know, they, they don't have sense, they, you know, that they're, they're too spiritually, you know, and they say all that, but you are the one just not seeing that, you're not even doing what God has called you to do. Many today have professed to be marketplace ministers when God did not send them there. They just picked up a ministry because they are comfortable there. We can make money and we can impact lives while we make the money. So we're marketplace ministers. There are many God didn't send on such assignments. Very many. Many on the pulpit too that God never sent. Very, very many. Very, very, very many. You know, you have to, and you know, you have to look at even those who've done this thing for years. All right. I mean, I just I'd use Kennedy's wife as an example. Even Gloria Copeland is not trying to do what Joyce Mayer is doing. You don't find Gloria Copeland trying to have women's meetings. Gloria Copeland just teaches a word. She does healing, healing, healing sessions. She writes books. Bishop David Oedipo, you know, has said too many times. He read Kenneth Copeland's book on prosperity. He really didn't get it. He read Guru Copeland's book on prosperity. The revelation showed up. Do you understand that? Now, that is a woman, but ministering on a neutral platform because that's what the gospel is. It's not for men or women. But then talk with say, oh, but Joyce Mayer is doing this. Let us also do women's stuff, stuff, stuff. I mean, there was a time, how many years ago? Over maybe 20, there about now. There was a Copeland girls meeting. It was Gloria and Terry, you know, and then, um, you know, Kelly. But what do you think they said there? This guy, these are word people. It's, it's word. Find your own assignment. All right, and I'm going back again to this because even being on the pulpit, you could get lost. Bishop David Oipodos, the post wife, is all jumping around trying to have women's conferences. Don't you think a lot of women will gather? She's not trying to do that. Pastor Deboe's wife is not building her own itinerary. But as a Pastor Funke Adejimo who looks up to them, who is all over the world. But they are not, they are not intimidated by that. They are not, you know. You find your place. You find your place. And you stay in your place because he would only reward you for what he called you to do. All right. So we've spent a whole lot of time hammering on a similar point. All right, use a number of Bible verses anyway, but I trust this is getting clearer. Haven't found it while finding it. In it, you must also understand that you were called 
does not mean it's time to run. I've always been blessed by the story of Cush. So Absalom, David's son, you know, just rose up and he declared himself, you know, against his dad, king and everything. And then, of course, there was a war, we could basically refer to it as civil war that broke out. So David had told his generals, right, Joab and the others, be gentle with this kid, don't hurt him. I mean, for my sake, Joab eventually, all right, I mean, Absalom's hair was, you know, <laughs> he had long hair, so his hair got cut right up by the tree. And they found him and Joab killed him. He wasn't supposed to. All right. So as great as men like Joab are, they are equally dangerous. All right. Joab was, I mean, one of David's mighty men, one of his top three. Joab would go conquer a place and then call David. So David eventually shows up and takes the glory. So that same Joab, you know, could eventually do whatever he felt like. And David told Solomon, don't let him escape with that thing. That is now 2 Samuel chapter 18. 2 Samuel 18, we could read from the 19th verse. I, I want us to read this one. 2 Samuel 18 from the 19th verse. I want you to see this very beautiful story. All right, so now Absalom is dead, all right? Then said Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, let me now run and bear the king's tidings, how that the Lord has avenged him of his enemies. And Joab said to him, you will not bear tidings today, but you will bear tidings another day. But this day you shall bear no tidings because the king's son is dead. He's a runner, okay? They carry messages and they run. Let's keep going, please. Then said Joab to Cushi, I love Kush. <laughs> Go tell the king what you have seen. And that's all Joab said, right? And Kushi bowed himself unto Joab, and then he ran, okay? Then said Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, yet again to Joab, but howsoever, let me, I pray you, also run after Kushi. And Joab said, wherefore would you run, my son, seeing that you have no tidings? Um... 22, maybe NLT. I just want something simpler. You know, um, it, maybe NLT. I just want to... Uh, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. NIV, let me see NIV. I'm staying something. I'm going to... I don't amplify it like amplify, but you don't understand something. Yes, this is it. Um, so it's still reward, but I like the there's no news, no tidings from King James, all right? Come what may, please let me run behind the Kushite, all right? But Joab replied, my son, why do you want to go? You don't have any news that will bring you reward. You you don't have, so you don't have tidings. King James was tidings, so you don't have, you, there's, there's no word in your mouth. <laughs> Let's go on. We could just stay here. Let's go on. He said, come what may, I want to run. So Drop said, run. Then Ahimaaz ran by way of the plane and outran the Kushite. I mean, he knew like a shortcut or something. All right, let's go on. While David was sitting between the inner and the outer gates, the watchman went up to the roof and of the gateway by the wall, and he looked out. He saw a man running alone. The watchman called out to the king and reported the king said, if he is alone, he must have good news. And the runner came closer and closer. Then the watchman saw another runner and he called down to the gatekeeper, look, another man running. And the king said, he must be bringing good news too. All right. The watchman said, it seems to me that the first one runs like Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok. He's a good man, the king said. He comes with good news. I mean, king is happy. Let's go on. Then Ahimaaz called out to the king. All is well. He bowed down before the king with his face to the ground and said, Praise be to the Lord your God. He has delivered up those who lifted their heads against my Lord the king. All right, we'll go on. The king asked, Is the young man Absalom safe? Ahimaaz answered, I saw great confusion just as Joab was about to send the king's servant and me your servant, but I don't know what it was. <laughs> so that's an interesting answer. The king said, stand aside and wait, meaning 
it, it didn't hit it home. Joab knew you don't know how to communicate this one. So he stepped aside and he stood there. Next one, please. Let's go. Then the Kushan arrived and said, my Lord, the King, hear the good news. The Lord has vindicated you today by delivering you from the hand of all who rose up against you. All right. Then the king asked the Kushite, is the young man Absalom safe? The Kushite replied, may the enemies of my lord, the king, and all who rise up to harm you be like that young man. Then we got it. <laughs> all right, we'll end here. Well, it ends here. The, the king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. And as he went, he said, oh, my son Absalom, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you, Absalom, my son, Absalom. I mean, th this is it. So as much as, you know, Amas could run, and as much as he could outrun Kush or Kushi or the Kushite, all right, as much as he could, he did not have the message. And eventually he was set aside. It's not enough to say I'm, I'm anointed. It's not enough to say I'm gifted. There's a place for that. But there's a place for there is a time in. We see in the life of David, interestingly, David was anointed king three times. The most popular one is the one in 1 Samuel chapter 16, all right, in the presence of his brothers. But that was not all of the anointings of David. David was anointed at that time, but don't forget he had to wait 13 years. That was when he was 17. It wasn't until he was 30, he finally could be in that position of being a king. So God might call somebody, but there's a training phase. That training phase could differ. For me, I knew I was called while on campus. God gave me different opportunities to serve. While on campus, I had a church at home, I had a church in school. I served in both places, more in school than at home because I was more in school than I was at home. Then I finished school and then I was led to, you know, another ministry, King's Word. And then I, you know, got supernaturally connected me to the resident pastor. I became his PA. And PA is not like protocol, show up in church, wearing suit. No, I will be with him in his house. I do laundries on Mondays. Laundry is not with a laundry machine. It was with my hands, all right? I wash in the mornings. I dry them. I bring them in before I go in the evenings. I iron as many as I can. I, mean, just book, I, I did all that kind of stuff. I did it for months. And it was, and Bible, Jesus had already said in the book of Luke, if you're faithful in little, it means you're faithful in much. Even after I was ordained a pastor, I still recall going to tell my pastor, I miss being your protocol officer. I miss being your PA. Or well, was personal assistant, actually. You know, I miss being your PA. I just miss it. But I understand that I've grown to where I need to be sent out to get the job done or to get things. And I said, yeah, that's, you know, a macho of sin. But I missed it. I, I just missed, you know, you can read him, calculate his movement. You know, you just, we bonded. We bonded, like big time. All right. I served Pastor Lan. I served Aaron K when he came off a couple of weeks that, you know, that year was that whole trip I got ordained, you know, into ministry. But it's just... That's God's track for me. Might not be God's track for you, but please get this. There is, and you will see it all through scripture. There are training seasons before that final coming out. And even that coming out has seasons in it. All right. Peter and the rest of the apostles were with Jesus. It wasn't the first year they were with Jesus that Jesus said they going to start casting out demons. It wasn't it. All right, he didn't just meet them and then they said, no, they rode with him. They watched him, they learned from him. Then he could send them out after a while. Okay, and even after that, he said to them, wait for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Wait for the Holy Spirit. You know, Paul's story, there was Arabia, there was Damascus. And even at that, he didn't just become an apostle. It was by Acts 13, he then became an apostle. But there are many young folk, you know, who don't even have 30 people they preach to. And then title is apostle. Some is your social media. It's already an apostle, something, 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 you know. But that might have been what God spoke to you about. We were under, so we can argue with that. But there is a face. 
There are faces in these things. There, there, there are. And we have to get the process. You don't come ahead of it like Moses did too. Okay? Because if you remember, God said to Abraham, they would, your children will be in captivity for 430 years. Okay? 430. That was what God, you're right, said. No, you know, forgive me. For 400 years. And then it became 430 years. All right? Because eventually, so it seemed as if the 390th year, just 10 years ahead, Moses then kills the Egyptian. All right? And then goes on exile for 40 years. So you now add 40 to 390. Then they came out at the 430th year, 30 years after what God said to Abraham. But God told Abraham 400 years. But do you understand what I'm saying? So it looked like Moses stepped out 10 years ahead of it. But we don't step out ahead. We don't step out too late. You don't say it's over. My point is the more you stay in sync with him, in fellowship with him, you would better fulfill the assignment. Don't run when there's no message. It's easy, and, and it's easy to just, you know, tell people whatever your hand finds to do, do. But even at that, learn to know and learn to be so yielded to know the Lord won't have me do this. The Lord won't have me do that. The Lord won't have me do this. The Lord won't have me do that. So that you don't run without a message. Okay? And like I said, you could watch through scripture. There are seasons. There are seasons. David, I mean, David was just so awesome. Many things to learn about the man. Let me pick out those three places so we see them. So in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, which like I said, we know that one already. David was anointed king in the presence of his brothers. Remember some all began from the, you know, elders down and then eventually, hey, where's the guy? We can't find him, all right? So there must be one more person. We can't find him amongst you know, these guys. And of course, he's out there in the field, will not sit down to eat until he comes. Then someone took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David, right? From that day forth, so someone rose up and went to Ramah. So here, David is anointed king. But don't forget, David had opportunities to kill Saul, but he never did because I could be anointed, but it's not time to be enthroned. We must separate the two. Some people have written books too soon. We've done CDs too soon. We've done, there are many things we've done too soon. They will be done, but you don't have the message. You don't, or it's not just time. You might even have the messages in a smaller form. Some people have relocated two ahead of time. In the name of God spoke to me about an international ministry. God told me, God told me that. And then to make it happen, we, if we might even get into the flesh. Some have had to do arranged marriages so that they could have landing, proper landing in a foreign country. All right, just find someone, arrange a marriage so you can legally be there to fulfill that intent. No, God cannot begin with you in the spirit and then end it up in the flesh. Did he call you? Did he give you an international ministry? I, I, I mean, timings are different for people. But the first time I knew about such was maybe 1990 something. I still remember I got prophecies between 2003. But I faced, I mean, between that time, 2003, what was I? 2003, I was, you know, pastoring OAU, you know, campus in Ife, Nigeria. And in 2003, I was posted to Abelkuta, you know, in state Nigeria. And I was in 2005. And then, so I, I, but calling to international ministry, a knowledge of international, let me call it a knowledge of international ministry. I'd had that since like, nine, maybe 99, 99, you know, 99. And there were prophecies also that I've had. I've had God speak to me about stuff. All right, but now, once again, my pattern is not yours. I'm only saying there are people that have now entered into the flesh in a bid to fulfill something they believe God spoke to them about in the spirit. All right, people have had to, you know, just manipulate their way into supernatural relationships. 
all right, just look for heavy, like we call them seeds to sow, to call that minister's attention. Oh, because I must get his anointing, you know, and all of that. And then you just use the flesh. Now we must sow seeds. We should honor ministry gifts and all that, you know. Let me just say we should. Maybe, you know, some might not just be must, but there's a biblical pattern. Bible says those who teach you the word. So there are enough scriptures to show that when you spiritually are nourished somewhere, you honor and whoever receives a prophet in the name of. So there's enough of scripture and all of that. But then it could be used manipulatively, you know? Like when Isaac said to Esau, go bring me venison so my soul will bless you. So now, oh, you know, just so we could manipulate it. And I've seen those kind of things. Oh, but walk in a time. Now, of course, there's the other extreme of, I don't care. I'll get to whoever I want to get to. I don't know. I don't need relationships in my life. But God uses relationships also to get us where we're going, all right? But don't manipulate it. Don't, don't manipulate it. Don't try to use the flesh to fulfill a spiritual vision. Please, please, don't, don't do that. So this is David now anointed by someone. But watch the process. David became the guy playing music for the same man that you know that God is not on him any longer, that God has anointed you. Someone else who played the wrong music that the demon would just stay and find you were killing the man or something, but the man even tried killing him. If you understand what I'm saying, David serves the man. David kills Goliath. David joins Saul's army. Saul tries to kill David. They'll push him into the battlefront. Go and bring four skins of the Philistines. And David kept on doing that. David served the same man he knew that he was taking over from. David could have ended Saul's life early, but then David would be premature in his season. This is something we need to get. If every believer is busy in their seasons, who will have supervisors this man in the body of Christ? I won't have people who are so half-baked, not so ready. All right? It's not just utterance alone. It's not. You have to break, oh dear, you have to build the capacity. Now in 2 Samuel chapter 2, all right, we we'll just read verse 4 straight. You might want to read it from the first verse. But 2 Samuel chapter 2 and then verse 4. So we see David's second ordination as it were all right and the men of judah came so notice it was just a tribe now the men of judah came and they and there anointed david king over the house of judah and they told david saying that the men of jabez gilead you know just anyway entered another conversation but the point here is david second anointed anointed in front of his brothers now anointed over judah now we go to 2 Samuel still, chapter 5, all right? And then the third verse, so we we'll just skip. So I just want you to see this. So all the elders of Israel, so first time in front of his brothers, second time Judah, now Israel. All the elders of Israel came to the king, to Hebron, and King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. Finally, finally, after battles, after many attacks over his life, after very many things, David finally walks into the beginning of what Samuel anointed him for 13 years prior. We see a similar pattern with the life of Joseph. Of course, Maybe a whole more horrible turnout of events, but then it still ends up glorious, all right? All right, maybe not turn out, it turned out right, but maybe the turn of events. We see Joseph dreaming a dream, and then he shares a dream with his brothers. Bible says he dreamed yet another dream, and he told them what he saw. But yet we moved, I'm sure you've heard a lot of preachings on that. He was in the pit. Then Potiphar's house, and then the prison, finally the palace. So he, he, he moved in those stages. He, 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 do you understand that? But God gave him a dream. And then it looked like I'm about to die. What, what will become of my dream? Oh, now I'm a slave. What will become of my dream? Now I'm in prison. What will become of my dream? 
But it was from that prison he ended up in Psalm 105, verse 17, Psalm 105, verse 17. It's just beautiful to see that this is, there's a pattern. There's calling, there's training. There's a calling, there's a training. So wherever you are, please find what season are you? What season? Find it. All right? Find it. So he sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant. So Bible is speaking, verse 18 now. Whose feet they hurt with fetters, and they laid him in iron, of course, as a, as a slave, right? Until the time, until the time that his word came and the word, the word of the Lord tried him. So all through that prophecy, as it were, was hanging over his life. Eventually it was fulfilled, but it didn't seem like hanging. Are there things God had told you? And you're like, when is it gonna, when is it gonna, when is it gonna, when is it gonna happen? That person is 20 something, he's really doing it. That lady is 20 something, she's doing that. Oh, he's doing 30 something, he's doing that. Yeah, just you dig in. Or a robot blew faster than Kenny Hagen. He became a national figure. I mean, Orobot was the man. He was the first person that I'm aware of, that I've read about, who did that, who brought in cameras into tent crusades. Orobot maximized the media. Orobot was the man. Presidents respected him. Orobot had influence in the US. I mean, built universe, all of that. Ken Hagen was just, an evangelist, all right? So when, it, it, we, when you even talk about the voice of healing back in the day, Orbos wasn't actively a member, but it did stuff with them. Ken Hagen was there. I mean, TL was going to hold on about them, you know, Katrin Coleman and everybody. But Ken Hagen wasn't a big name in the voice of healing. No, he wasn't. He was not. He wasn't. Oh, but Oro, come on. Oro was the big man. But by the time both men entered into what now? Their 60s, their 70s, their 80s. I mean, Ken Hagen was already now gagging like 25, 20 something, 20 something thousand people at, at his camp meetings. Maybe when he was, maybe what now? 50s and 60s. Or no, when he was in studies. No, when he was in 40s. I don't think so. I, I doubt that. Really doubt that. Because camp meetings began, I think, in the 70s. You know, so. Pff, Robert Johnson, I think, you know, might have mixed those things, but I know one was 73. So, but anyway, so it was, it was, what was that? So at the end of the day, and it's not a popularity contest. At the end of the day, just stay, run your race. There is him calling you, but then there is him training you. You yield to the training processes. If he plants you somewhere, stay there. Oh, but this is not okay here. That's not okay there. Maybe that's part of what you have to learn there. How some things might not work. All right? And maybe part of what you now learn is to be a change agent. I didn't say revolution. <laughs> you know, agent. But a change. How to... Be a blessing to the lead pastor or to the, you know, lead ministry person there. And you become a blessing. You're seeing the things wrong, but God gives you the wisdom. They say, but I'm trying to make advices. Nobody's listening. Maybe you also will learn right there how not to be hurt when they don't take what you say. And bless God. Just bless God. <laughs> Do you understand this? Because if we don't see these things by the spirit, who we'll someone could come into a new land, right? And say, what kind of ministry have they been doing here? You know, until we came, you know, nothing happened. We, we were the ones. You see from the point of pride and how that they didn't do much. But actually, you didn't realize that God actually was sending you there because he put an anointing on you that would help the land. I don't know if you got that. God sort of struggled. People are doing like, move, move there. There's someone on you that will be a blessing to these people. But you didn't see it as that. You just saw it as nobody was doing anything serious till we came. We, we got it right. No, that was why you were sent. 
So when we don't see the reasons for these things, we, we miss it. We mess up. So what season are you in? How do you know? It's relationship with the Lord. Sometimes it's time to do something, sometimes it's time to hold back. It's not every revelation he shares with you that you need to share with anybody. I've had stuff that I've written that I've never said to anyone. <laughs> They're too big <laughs> for my mouth to share right now. All right? Is everything God gives you that goes on your status or social media or you, you, you relax, you, you hold on. I've heard Ken Higgins say something and he said the last time I said this was 25 years ago. Ken Higgins wasn't hungry to share the latest revelations. The last one I said, this was 25 years ago. I'm like, oof. I've heard Kenneth Copeland teach something and the Lord said, don't teach it anymore. The body is not ready for this. It took 30 years. The Lord said, teach it now. 30, like, some of you are not even 30, right? And some of you are just over 30. 30 years. The Lord said, I mean, the Lord didn't tell him to wait for 30 years. I just said, no, no, don't teach this. No, no, don't teach it. So he stopped. It was 30 years later, the Lord said, now go ahead. Like, whoa. So when you listen to these kinds of people talk, you're like, wow. And when you see people shining, blazing, doing well, pray for them. Wish them well. Many have blazed too. All right? Many have blazed. I remember, you know, I, I was at a church, you know, in Nigeria, and then I had this friend. We we're both in the same school, and we found out we're in the same church. So, when there's a special program, maybe I could go to their house, and then we're there waiting for the time of service. So, we're busy just in, you know, just talking and all. And then she told me, oh, there was a church across, you know, the, the street. She's like, oh, haven't you heard of that? I'm like, no. She's like, oh, really? You don't know that? I'm like, no. And then she gave me some facts. I'm like, seriously? That person, that church, sure, yeah. And later, I mean, I was still a new believer then, maybe about two years, two years plus, telling you no too many stories. But then later, I started hearing more, but I'd seen the church, I knew where it was. I mean, this man had used helicopters to distribute flyers back in the 70s. 70s, guys, the 70s. So I used a, a chopper to distribute flyers, like, whoa. In the field of evangelism, those were the big names. But by 1990, what was that now? 98? No, maybe like 99-ish. Yeah, maybe 99-ish. No, 95, 97. Maybe seven. Let's just say six, seven-ish, thereabout. Nowhere, nowhere. Church was like a shadow of itself from a story I start hearing later. You pray for people. Paul said, pray for us. So pray for me. All right? Pray for me. All right? Pray. Pray for me, my wife. Just pray. Just pray. Pray. For, you know, whatever God puts in your heart, right? Because people could even envy people up there. And some, even just one person up there. Listen, listen. If someone is doing great, maybe like a Joyce Miller preaching great, as someone feels God has given her the same type of Joyce Mayer, Joyce Mayer does not have to die for you to fulfill your assignment. So some just wait, thinking that person must be out of the scene before I can fly. No. Ken Hagen had been teaching the message of faith for years. And Ken Copeland heard it, started preaching it, and then it became the more the merrier. Don't you see? And then Hagen would gladly bring in Copeland to his meetings, and then Copeland would even attend. And then Hagen gave him certain platforms. It, the message could spread. Hagen didn't have to die or fall for Copeland to rise. Copeland didn't have to die for Jerry Savell to find expression. We could all find expression. We could all, all find expression in the things he's called us to do. In the things he's called us to do. All right, Billy Brim, many of you might know her. I mean, she has a ministry on about years back. If you've seen the old copy of How You Can Be Led by the Spirit of God, they had this dove on it and all that. 
She was an editor. She worked in Kenny Higgins ministry. She did books for Higgins, for Lester, for Casey Price. It, it, some people, that's their own assignment to just, you know, for some other people, it's media. I mean, even Joel Osteen was, I think, media for his dad for about 28 years. Never preached a sermon. It was his dad's camera person handling media stuff. 28 years. Then his dad was in the hospital. They said, so who's going to preach? No, I think the dad's electoral preacher. I'm, I'm trying to remember that part. Well, just in case I mix it up with. Then the dad passed on. And they were wondering, so who's going to pass to the church? And Joel said, I will. And everybody felt <laughs> like, you. Yeah. But whatever anybody wants to say about Joel, since they, I'm, I'm not his policeman. And God is not going to judge me for whether Joel Osteen, you know, did what God sent to do or not. Oh, dear Lord Jesus. Has it helped you? <laughs> All right. So I'm going to end on this. Jesus said to them in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, stay in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. Stay in Jerusalem. All right. Meaning, guys, we can't get this thing done without the Holy Spirit. Please understand this. We cannot get this done without the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8, Jesus said, you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes and you'll be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, all the most parts of the earth. We can't get this job done without the Holy Spirit. Philippians chapter two, I want us to read that one. Philippians 2, 13, 12 and 13. I'm actually going to 13, but 12 and 13. We'll use the King James, then we'll maybe read 13 in the Amplified. You can't, you can't. So all this whole stuff we said today, the biggest thing you could do for yourself is maintain fellowship with the Holy Spirit, okay? All right, so it says, wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but also much more in my absence, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. So this verse 12, so 13. So it says, work out, okay? It didn't say work for your salvation. People read it that way. It just says, work out. Why? For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do of his. So God is working where? in you what should you do work out so god is working in you so you now allow the working within to flow outside that's so that's when we put it together that way it helps but i want us to see the amplified of yeah verse 13 it says not in your own strength because we could hear all of this and go ah oh, ah oh, where do i start from and i've been i've been there oh i remember when in 2006 I arrived in Ijabode, Ogun State, you know, in Nigeria, when you say it was dark, it, it was dark. I, I couldn't, when you can't decipher the next thing, you just know you've arrived at that location and the enemy is bombarding you with thoughts of confusion. I mean, I bombarded thoughts initially of, you know, God is saying, you did not deal with that. God had helped the Holy Spirit help me there. But this one was now, where do I start from? How do I begin? I know I've arrived where, but not in your own strength. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Not in your own strength, for it is God who is all the while effectually at work in you. Hallelujah. Could you just read with me? Energizing and creating in you the power and desire both to will and to work for his good pleasure and satisfaction and delight. God is all the while effectually at work in me. God is all the while effectually at work in you, energizing and creating in us, guys, the power and the desire, both to will and to do, all right, both to will and to work for his good pleasure his satisfaction and the like. God is working in me. God is working in you. So don't quit on him. Don't let your mind sabotage the process and say it's over for me. It's done. I'm done. God can't, you know, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't do that. Second Timothy 2 says in a great house, there are vessels of honor, vessels unto dishonor. God is not determining who is honor and dishonor. He said, if you purge yourself from these things, you will be a vessel unto on our feet for the master's use. So we determine. So how do I become usable? Most important thing, I repeat again, 
maintain that fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I'm yours. Spend time in prayer, spend time in study, do the best you can. Wherever you are planted, stay there. There's a process to this thing. My process won't be your process, but there is a process to this thing. And then in your fellowship with him, I remember I was 99, I was on campus then. And then, you know, I was fellowship secretary, God had been talking to me about ministry. And then there was, you know, it was my birthday, my, you know, there was, you know, fellowship guys came around. And then there was this other fellowship pastor who, you know, was my fellowship pastor's friend. And he, he was around that day, so they walked in together. He, he got praying for me and he said, you know, God have me tell you that, yeah, I began to say a number of stuff. So I said, there are other things that if I tell you now, your mind will not be, be able to handle them. And some of what the Lord had told me already, as of that time, they were big for my small mind. And I'm like, oh, awesome. Because, <laughs> and, and really, some things, you know, one has seen over the years, just follow, follow the pattern. Follow the pattern. Follow the pattern. There is a pattern. Okay, there is a pattern. There is a pattern. There's a pattern. Yours might not be Moses' way. Might not be Joseph's way. Might not be David's way. Might not be Saul's way or Paul. All right. He might not be Peter, you know. Remember James and John? They came with their mom to tell Jesus one should be at the right, one should be at the left. Jesus said, huh. good desire, but they have to drink from the cup. All right, so it's okay to have those big dreams and visions and God showed me this, but there's just a cup. It's not the Jesus kind of cup, but it's, it's a cup. All right, you drink your own cup on the way. Those things toughen you. When you learn to believe for two people, three people, one sheep, two souls, pray for one, you know, just those little, little faithfulness. Why nobody sees you, nobody rewards you, nobody appreciates you, but you're there. And it's toughening you and building capacity. And then the dealings of the Lord with you. And please, maybe I end on that. Note the dealings of God in your life. When the angel saluted Mary, but I said, Mary took note of what kind of salutation it might be. This might be when Simeon, the elderly man, spoke. But I said, both Mary and Joseph, you know, were amazed at the words then after they had you know left jesus in the temple and then they found him and he said i need to go about my father's business you know Bible said they got back home and jesus was submitted to them and he said and maybe kept these things in our hearts so it's it's like you know yeah something's happening here so yeah take it take note of the dealings of god take note of the dealings of god please i beg you take note of the dealings of you know, how God leads you, guides you, and, and just humble yourself there. All right? Oh, thank you there, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise. We give you praise. Please, if you have questions, comments, you could always just reach out personally, all right? It's my own joy to be with you on this journey. Let me pause this. But I, I believe it's helped. Amen, right? Oh, 